All right, now we get to the thank you part of just welcoming everyone this morning. Um, a big thank you to Linda Lotz and Irene Alexiou who have come um, today to um, give us two sessions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Um, when they both um, had proposals for workshops Saturday, it was exciting to think about how they might work together um, to provide us with some really deep and broad ideas about this topic. Um, as a yearly meeting, part of what we can do is gather together, create these opportunities to be all together for um, wor worship, um, to learn together like we are today, and also to release the gifts of those among us in the yearly meeting, um, which is part of what will happen today as we um, enjoy these, these workshops. So much thanks to Linda and Irene, and I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Thank you, uh, Melinda. Um, I guess I want to re return the thanks uh, to Melinda for suggesting that we put our two web, uh, our two proposals together. Um, Irene and I have worked together before in uh, planning the Facebook for Friends workshop that we did more than a year ago. <clears throat> uh, that and some other kinds of organizing and outreach materials can be found on the South Jersey Quakers YouTube channel. Um, and we'll be putting this uh, recording on the South Jersey Quakers YouTube channel um, when it's ready. Um, and also many thanks to Kamani for helping us with the tech work today. Um, I'd like to give just a little background on uh, the South Jersey Quakers project um, because that's the focal point of our conversation today. Um, several years ago, uh, some friends from Salem, Burlington, and Haddonfield quarters got together, and we were all staff of different kinds of projects, um, and we wanted to be able to find a way to work together, <clears throat> but we all had really different jobs. But the one thing that was consistent was that we were all responsible for outreach, and we all recognized that we, you know, really desperately needed to raise the awareness of friends in the in the pop in the public's eye here. So um, from that came the idea of doing a website and some social media advertising to drive people to the website. Uh, from that, we now, uh, two years later, um, have not only the website and are doing the social media advertising, we now have a monthly newsletter to keep people apprised of different friends activities here in, uh, in the three quarters, as well as, um, important things that are happening amongst friends um, across the US and with Ukraine. We've been including some of the exciting conversations and um, opportunities for shared worship um, around that. Um, we also, um, as I mentioned, have the South Jersey Quakers uh, YouTube channel. There's now more than 50 um, different videos, most of them recorded in the last couple of years. Um, and on a wide variety of topics. Um, we hope you'll look um, at that at some point. Um, we also discovered that a lot of small meetings don't have the capacity to main a website for themselves. So um, Carlton has just, um, one of the people you'll meet uh, this morning, um, has put together a one page website that is very simple, but will give people a uh, presence on the web um, and then they can have some kind of a social media account that they can uh, add things to throughout the year. We also have a pre-registration process that allows uh, our quarters and our meetings to use when they're planning an event. <clears throat> we provide, um, once they have their flyer or information put together, <clears throat> um, Josh Ponter, again, you'll meet, um, puts together a registration page that uh, includes uh, different kinds of questions for people and provides an opportunity to collect um, either donations or uh, fees for that activity. And then we accompany the meeting um, through the full process, monitoring the, the different people are registered uh, up till the very last minute. And then we provide the names and uh, contact information uh, to the people who attended the program that that meeting held. Um, and so I, I'd also like to thank um, 
this, this work really would not have been possible without the Shoemaker Fund, Dolier Foundation, uh, PYM's membership development granting group and Westfield monthly meeting. So um, we hope you'll check out the website. There's a lot of uh, interesting things there. Uh, friends meeting schools, historic sites and retirement communities. Um, there's an interactive map and so on. So onto the uh, schedule for today. There's a very brief schedule in the uh, chat. It's the very first thing. Um, this morning we'll begin with presentations on the two models that we mentioned, and that will feature Alex, excuse me, Alice um, Maderich from uh, Barnicket Friends Meeting, and also um, Earl Evans, who's clerk with Cropwell Meeting. And that session, um, we'll, we'll start with some questions from um, Josh Ponter, who's um, the uh, quarter organizer for the South Jersey Quakers Project. He works uh, here in Haddonfield Quarter. And um, Charles Hardy, <clears throat> who is um, the organizer for um, Burlington Quarter. And then we'll have a, a brief Q&A discussion session that will be uh, facilitated by Carlton Crispin, who's our organizer from Salem Quarter. And he's also been doing um, a good bit of our website and um, social media work. So let's begin with um, Josh and Charles. Charles, do you mind starting? Um, Earl is having some technical difficulties and will be here um, momentarily. It's absolutely fine. Um, and uh, yeah, to make sure. So Agnes, um, who is identified here in Barnegat, New Jersey, but she's actually Agnes. Uh, you can take yourself off mute and um, We'll talk about uh, your meeting and what uh, uh, what has happened and what uh, led you there. Uh, can you uh, start uh, with a little bit about Barnegat meeting um, as it uh, you know as it was, let's say, um, a couple of years ago or a few years ago? Yes, I can, Charles. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, Barnegat Meeting is small, we're at the shore. Uh, we, at one time, were quite large. In the 80s, we had about 40 people attending. We had a first day school. Uh, over the years, the meeting got smaller and smaller. I've been attending for a little over 10 years. And in that time, I saw the trajectory was downward. We maybe had 20 people coming on a Sunday when I started, then 10 now four to six come on a Sunday routinely. And so when South Jersey Quakers contacted us approximately two years ago and offered support for outreach, I was ready to dive into that um, because we were talking about laying down a meeting if it continued the way it was getting smaller and smaller. And um, so we started a very active outreach program and Charles, I'm not sure uh, if you want to keep asking me questions or if I should just tell more about what it was then versus now. I, I do want to bring uh, bring around the um, point you just made, which was that um, it was almost like the plan was to lay down the meeting, but because of the contact from um, outside of the meeting, South Jersey Quakers in this instance, uh, and uh, the um, uh, support that was really the thing that led you to do the outreach? Do you think that it, without that support, it would have been a decision you would have made? No, we were, it was our fear. When we saw that over the years, the meeting was getting smaller and smaller, we thought, where will this end? Uh, but with being laid down and none of us who were active in the meeting wanted it, uh, but we were afraid that we would come to that. And so when we were offered the opportunity of assistance with outreach, I, my only involvement in the meeting to that point was I went there on Sunday and I worshiped. And when we had our 250th celebration, I was asked to be the one to go and buy the cake. So I bought the cake for that. And uh, I was not real active in the meeting otherwise. 
But when I saw the opportunity to get support for outreach and grow our meeting, um, I took it back to the rest of the meeting and said, let's do this. Thank you. Uh, so uh, one of the things that, um, uh, that we see here is that um, within your meeting, um, uh, someone had to step up. Uh, and that's, that's kind of a theme across the things that someone has to, has to be in the position to grab. And when you're a small meeting, it's not like there's, you've got your outreach committee and you're this committee and that committee, you've got a very few number of individuals. Uh, and so, and, and thank you for, for being that. Um, can you tell about the activities that you, um, that you have undertaken? Yes, we started out with, um, because we're small, we didn't have any committees. So everything we did was what we used to call, quote, the committee of the whole. And so we convened and we discussed what could we do for outreach. And I found out from that, that the meeting had previously done outreach maybe 10 years ago. And I never got a clear picture of what happened with that outreach effort. Um, and it had somehow along the way gotten dropped. So there were some people who felt it didn't work and we shouldn't try it again. And other people who were very enthusiastic, yes, let's um, revitalize the meeting, let's do outreach. And so the process was that as a group, we said, what activity should we do? And what we settled on as a group was that we'd have a monthly event. And in the first year, our goal was to get ourselves known because in talking to people when we started the outreach effort was that people thought we were a historic building that was closed up or that we were a meeting that was only active in the summer. Uh, people thought we didn't have electricity when in fact we have Wi-Fi. Um, so I was stunned to find out all the misconceptions that were about Quakers and about our meeting. So we set out to change that. And in our first year, we had a mix of musical events and speakers that who would be of interest to Quakers and um, the general public as well in order to raise awareness of Quakerism and our meeting. Thank you. Uh, how, how, did, uh, how, how did you find the response to be to these events? Um, were, were there disappointments with it, with it you know? Uh, what, what was the Hello, result? This is uh, Bill Cohen and Earl Evans. Finally, able to make it on. Hello. Hi, Earl. You'll be coming up. Uh, okay, Agnes? Yes, hi. Uh, so we're talking about Barnett meeting right now. And uh, some events were very popular and well attended. Our first event was a holiday concert in December of... Um, 2020. And uh, it's a local musician who's very popular. He plays for some other Quaker meetings. And uh, we got about 100 people at that event. And it was a Zoom event. Um, and then because of the pandemic, we were a little limited in what we could do. We had periods where we're not meeting in person on Sunday. We were Zooming with other meetings on Sunday. And our meeting house was closed. So we started out in a period when Zoom was, people were learning how to use Zoom and they were on the learning curve of it, having all Zoom events and the attendance was mixed. We had some topics that were wildly popular. We had um, Trinity Norwood who spoke about uh, indigenous Americans and uh, where they are today. And we had, close to 50 people for her. And then we had some environmental topics where we had 10 people. So varied all over the place. What, um, what, what how were you able to, um, uh, or were you able to is really the question, um, uh, turn this uh, interest in your events into interest in uh, the meeting as a, as a Quaker worship uh, group? Yes. Yes, we're finding that um, people are contacting us. People are stopping by the meeting house when we, we've now been having a number of events in person. Our first event in person was last September. We had Keith Combs, a classical guitarist, and he 
previously played at our 250th. And uh, so he, and he's a, he attends worship at another meeting. Um, so we have good attendance at his concert and people who come to the meeting house pick up literature, they ask us questions. So it's definitely sparking interest in Quakerism and in our meeting. And so the, the way that you would um, bring these people along as it were, uh, would be um, literature and conversation. I mean, those, those are the things. Um, Follow-ups and everything are, are work well. You're able to get people's information for it. Well, you have, ah, if they register for an event, you've got their email right there. Correct, yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so the success um, appears to be um, good. And how do you feel about the future and about what's, you know, I, yeah, give me, a, give me your, your view. We feel very encouraged about the future of the meeting. What we've seen is um, many of us, like me, just came and sat there and worshiped in silence for an hour on Sunday. And now we are getting a lot of things done. We, uh, a trivial story is uh, a few years ago, we decided we needed a new shed. We have a small one room meeting house. We emptied the shed into the meeting house and everything was stacked around everywhere under the benches. We have no closets. And so the place was kind of messy and disorganized. And you know, it's like your own home, you get used to how it looks. So we were coming on Sunday and not paying a lot of attention. And we looked around and said, you know, why aren't we buying a shed? So we moved ahead with that decision, cleaned up the meeting house, and we all looked around and said, it feels so serene and welcoming and peaceful. The nicer we're making it look inside the meeting house, it's more welcoming. And we're enjoying more sitting there and worshiping than we did a year ago when we had boxes stacked everywhere. And so we're all very excited about the future. There's, we're, we're just about at the end of the time we're gonna spend I on this. So there is a question. One second. Uh oh, yes, are you able to hear now? Agnes? Whoops. Okay, well, maybe we'll be at the end of, of Agnes. There is a question about what platforms are used to promote the events. Um, uh, and are you hearing anything now, Agnes? Yeah, I reset my audio. Okay, for okay, okay. Uh, if we can just, for, for a quick moment, um, how were you promoting the events? What platforms, what ways? Okay, we, um, for the most part, the events have been Zoom or hybrid. But I'm, how did you promote them? How, promoted, who, how did you let people know? We promoted them on a PYM website, on uh, South Jersey Quakers newsletters. We also have been posting on uh, social media, Facebook, Reddit, uh, AARP events website, next door. And um, when we had a bluegrass concert, I found there was a bluegrass website. So we posted on the bluegrass website. So for every event, we look for new ways to promote it. And as you already mentioned, direct emails. We have a mailing list of former uh, previous attendees and we promote events to those individuals. Okay, well, we'll wrap here because um, I know that Josh has got to um, uh, have his chance and we don't wanna stretch the time out too much. Thank you so much, Agnes, thank you. Thank you, Charles, thank you everyone. Mm -hmm. Hi friends, um, let me introduce you to um, Earl Evans, who is the clerk of Crockwell meeting, kind of the de facto clerk, and um, Bill Cohen, who is their newest member. Um, I'm sorry guys for, um, they had so much trouble logging on, but I'm, I'm so glad you could join us. And we have a couple quick questions for you. Um, so let me ask Earl about the state of your meeting pre-COVID. What was it like? How many attenders did you have? Um, how active were you? Oh, you guys are muted. There we go. Go ahead, Earl. This is where we started and so forth. Yep. All right. Uh, before the uh, pandemic, uh, we had 
let's see. Okay, here we go. Before the pandemic, we had uh, uh, six members plus two attenders sometime. And then by 2022, two members had died, one had moved, one had aged out. And basically, there was two of us left to attend and two attenders once in a while. Uh, and then last fall, which was, we had an open house, I think it was uh, around the 1st of October, and uh, we had a good turnout. Uh, Linda Lux said uh, that uh, she thought it was as high as 60 or 70. I'm not sure, not many, but people come and go and so forth is hard to tell exactly how many. But that was very successful. We had people come back and uh, uh, what we've done since then was to have two programs in November, two in December, and then one a month thereafter. And they, some of them have been very well attended. We've had as many as 25 to 30 or a couple of them. And the other ones maybe 10 or 12 and so forth. We have always been open. We've been closed down for the for the uh, COVID. And uh, we had visitors, of course, came from Mount Laurel. They they in turn had closed down and meet outside and and uh, so forth. And they some of them didn't agree with all, all that, so they came over and visited with us. And uh, we really are not at, attuned to the idea of, of scalping members from other local meetings. That's not what we have any intention of doing. Um, so anyway, we had the programs. We still have programs. And uh, our programs run, as I mentioned, uh, well, I remember I didn't mention, but we had a very successful one with uh, Stone Soup put on by Bill, Bill's uh, sister from Hanfield Meeting. And uh, we've had other, we had a program on climate change and put on by a professor from Rowan College. Birds Among Us. Huh? Birds Among Us. Yeah, we had one on Birds Among Us and uh, we had one on the I pinched it yeah. for one on where I do do this program on uh, German prisoners of war held in the U.S. during World War II, and uh, we've had others. We have one coming up the 17th of July, which is going to be on uh, a, a doctor from Medford Lees who took a week of her vacation and went to Honduras to help people down there. And you know, the poorer people because they living in homes with dirt floors and that sort of thing. And uh, so she's going to come and tell us about that story. Um, and one of the best things we did on the, on the, the programs and so forth is they really, I believe, if you want to get something done, you get the women involved. And uh, Linda Lutz has been instrumental in all this. My daughter has been involved. Daughter now is on the downside. She lives a hundred miles from here. And uh, but she is going to join her daughter, my, grand, my granddaughter. She is going to join. And. Uh, and her name is Christy, and she has been very helpful on these programs and, and the, the computer work and so forth. Um, we, uh, yeah, we have a, a new member, which is sitting here, Bill Cullen, and we have uh, another one that's committed, and 
as well. Their granddaughter's committed and, and daughter. Um, but we, but the ones that really put on these programs and so forth and got it all going and and uh, it's been limitless. Of course, I had to open the door every Sunday, but uh, other than that, uh, our daughter, uh, a niece, who unfortunately is be, will be going under with uh, cancer treatment starting next month and uh, for about the third time. So uh, we have another commitment from uh, a membership for, from uh, uh, Young Chow, he's Korean. And uh, we've had some visitors since then. And the best thing I've done is hired Lila Cleaver. She actually belongs to the church up in Mifflin Lakes and hasn't been tended for well over a year. Her parents are buried at Crockwell and her daughter, one, one of her daughters is uh, kind of in the process of joining Hattonfield meeting. So, uh, but Lila is a very talented person and uh, gets things done, and she's working on a secretary treasurer. I haven't given it the treasurer's job yet, but I uh, intend to. But, uh, hopefully, she will join. And that, from there on, I'm not sure where we are, but I, we want to, in the, in, the, in the months ahead, is to continue our programs with good programs. And if we want to take some trips, we want to local trips. We want to go to Alice Paul's house. We want to go to uh, John Woman's house and there are other places in South Jersey that we should visit. And uh, anyway, we're, we're optimistic depending on how we continue to keep our tour group together and uh, and reach out to people and so forth. So one of the things we're hoping to do today is find out some of the things that you folks have done that has helped you. Thank you. Um, it sounds like you, you feel really optimistic about the future. It sounds like- well, um, you... It depends on, on what time it is, because you know, I'm up and down on this thing. because It's a very curious position. When we have two people, you know, it looked like there was no future that we managed to crawl out of that with the programs and with the uh, open house. The open house was, was very good. Uh, and people like Bill Cohen here coming on is, is uh, because, you know, the uh, the other guy that was attending with me, he's 80 years old. I'm uh, 86. So how much longer do I have? I, you know, I can't remember names. I can't remember this, that, the other thing. So, uh, the Bill, future you, is going to be dependent upon the people that are helping. You know? Bill, do you do, would you say a few words about um, the process of um, integrating into the meeting? Sure. So, um, my first. Uh, Quaker meeting was my sister's wedding in 1976. I didn't understand what was going on there. All I remember was it was very peaceful. Um, and then it was, you know, probably three years ago, <clears throat> I was going through a, like a personal crisis. So I started attending Haddonfield uh, on Sunday mornings just to have a place to go and find some peace which I did every Sunday morning. I found that sense of peace, right? Uh, then my nephew, Josh, happened to mention to me that Crockwell was in danger of closing. And I was always taught that if you wanna be in service, uh, go where you're needed. It would have been very easy for me to join Haddonfield and just blend in with the crowd. <clears throat> but I thought it much better if there was a meeting that could use support, that's the meeting to join. So I went to the, uh, went to Cropwell a couple times. 
Uh, I talked to Earl. He told me about the process and I wrote a letter um, that I would like to be uh, accepted as a member. And, um, you know, they they voted me in. So I, I am a member. And what I'll tell you that when I go there, I feel so much at peace. And I do feel optimistic about the future because I'm a committed person, um, you know, and, you know, I, I don't think Earl's going anywhere for a while, but, you know, I'm 63 myself and uh, we do need to bring some younger people in uh, to carry the mantle, uh, you know, once, uh, we, you know, the current leadership moves on. <clears throat> but um, I love the meeting. I love the meeting space. Um, it's very, very peaceful. And, um, you know, I just love sitting around the fire, like during the colder months. And um, it's so very inviting. I've brought one friend so far, and he has indicated that he would like to make that a, you know, a regular attendance himself. Um, but he hasn't come back since. So I have to, you know, remind him. But, you know, I mentioned it to a few people. And, uh, you know, I just have to stay on them. You know, like, come visit, come, come experience the peace that is available there. And, um, you know, I, I love the meeting, and I'm going to continue attending. Thanks, guys. Um, I think we are um, opening the room for question and answers now. Is that right? Right. Yeah. You can uh, put questions in the chat if you don't want to uh, don't want to uh, say them, and I'll read them for you. Um, otherwise, please raise your hand if you had a question for Josh, Charles, or our guests for the next uh, about 15 minutes or so. And if no one has any uh, questions, um, please feel free to share anything that your meeting's doing or some ideas. Uh, so I saw the one question about what platforms are we using to prevent to promote the events. And uh, we do have a Facebook page that um, Earl's daughter manages. Um, there's another Facebook page that somebody else created uh, that we need to, uh, Josh and I need to talk about how to regain control of that, that we'll take that offline. Um, but all of our events are promoted via Facebook. Um, and of course we have flyers that we hand out as well. I believe you have um, an Instagram account as well, right? Um, if there is one, I wasn't aware of it. Okay. <laughs> so I, I saw um, Meg Lutton, forgive me, I'm bad at names, and then uh, Sue's iPad next. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask Earl, what sorts of things you did at your open house? What sorts of things did you do at your open house? We, uh, at the open house, we had some, some uh, I think, some cemetery games with uh, the children that were there. We had, uh, we had uh, uh, refreshments, sandwiches, and I guess they were hobies, as I recall. And uh, we uh, gave it, handed out brochures and, and uh, were available to anyone that could attend it. And uh, we just socialized, is what amounted to. And the people from town were there. Some of them had no idea that there was a Quaker's place in, in Marlton. And uh, they wanted to know what Quakerism was all about. So uh, if, and there was a lot of the, some of the Quakers that had not been there for some time, uh, they came back. And uh, we'll try to get with them, see if we can reunite them with the uh, crop world. Can, can I also say um, they had um, tables set up for FCNL and um, Historical Society. And we also invited um, members from other meetings just to come and, um, and hang out for a couple hours or so. Um, so that if it, new people came, they didn't feel so alone. Uh, Sue? Hi. Um, I'm, I'm glad there's enthusiasm 
And I'm glad there's an awareness. That's what I'm hearing so far that has been accomplished. My question is, and, and I was at Cropwell when you had the open house uh, and there were a lot of people. My question is, maybe I'm, I'm speaking from our experience. We've had events and people would come, but we'd never, there would be no interest in coming back and being a part of the meeting. Have you seen any uh, movement other than relatives? Cause I, I know uh, Kropel has a lot of relatives going there. Uh, any other folks outside of the relatives, close friends kind of thing um, actually coming to meeting because of the events or the outreach? I think Agnes might have something to say about that. Agnes? We had uh, one lady that who used to attend, she came back a few times. And, uh, and another gal from the local area, she came for the first time to the open house and returned several times. Uh, and I've talked to her since then. He was going to come back a couple of weeks ago. It was raining and she didn't come back. She lived a couple of blocks from there. Uh, but let's see, there's, there were some other people there too. I can't remember right now, but uh, that they returned maybe once. But that was not a big thing. But anyway, the people were aware of Cropwell, which hadn't been, they had never known about it before. And uh, we considered it a, a success. It was even if it was just for mostly Quakers that came back to visit, uh, even from other meetings and so forth. Uh, it was we we felt it was a, a good program, and our programs following that were helpful, and uh, we hope to grow from that. But it's going to take a lot of of reaching out and, and uh, condoling people to come, to come back. But we need to, I, we feel that we need to encourage speaking in meeting as well as Bible readings in meeting. We don't have a Sunday school. We need something to uh, help with that. And uh, Financially, we're in good shape. We have friends for this year. We also have uh, money in checking account. And we're fortunate enough to have a cottage that used to be a school and so forth. And, and uh, used to be the caretaker's house. Well, the caretaker we had moved away. And uh, I'm not going to go into details of that, but that was not very good. And uh, we're, we're getting a check from the realtor of over uh, well, twelve hundred dollars a month, so that that really carries us. And then uh, we have given money to fill up your early meeting this year, as well as uh, uh, Hadfield Quarter, because Linda Lutz has been so helpful in in uh, her efforts. So. Financially, we're all right, and uh, continue in this direction because of the cottage that we've run out. No question about that. We want to get a decent sign out front. And, uh, they, they are very expensive, so we're just starting to work on that. So, um, Agnes, did you have one one thing to say on that, or and then we have uh, one question from the chat quickly, so. Okay, sure. Well, on that topic of people coming, what we found is we've gotten a lot more engaged with the local community and somebody who wandered in the door one Sunday and saw us there having a discussion. We were sitting around having pizza and, and talking about events. She was very excited and uh, she's a regular participant in our outreach effort even though she has not become a member, you know, it takes time for people to decide, is this the religion for them? 
um, my husband and I have been interested in Quakerism since, well, 50 years, let's say, close to 50 years. And we sent our daughter to Morristown Friends all the way through 12th grade. And since the early 80s, we've been living across the street from the Barnegat Friends meeting and never went there on a Sunday. Every weekend we were there and looking out our window going, oh, here are the Quakers again. And it took us 10 years or more to walk across the street. And once we walked in, we felt like it was our home and we continued to go. So it takes time for people to decide um, this is what they want in their lives. And, and we're seeing, we're developing a lot of interest in a local community. So it's not translating to an inrush of members and attenders, but we've gotten a couple through outreach. And starting from four to six of us coming on a Sunday, a couple more <laughs> could be seen as a 30% increase. <laughs> and um, we're interacting with the local community who didn't even know we were open. They were driving past on weekdays and seeing the building shut up. So they thought it was part of, there's a historic village half a mile away. And it looks just like our meeting house. It's a bunch of little old buildings. And they thought we were just part of that. And our building was too big to move down the street to be with the others. Um, so there's definitely a lot more interest and a lot more knowledge of Quakers and Quakerism through our activities. Thanks. Um, we only have about four minutes left, so, but uh, there was a question in chat. Um, what about enc encouraging younger members by providing um, uh, programs for children? And uh, some people apparently have, from their meeting, had suggested a nature camp and um, uh, a little bit more in chat. But any thoughts on that from either of you? Okay, I'll go first. We're very interested in having children more involved and we've been reaching out. There's a local garden club and um, in Barnegat and they're doing, it's a community garden group and they're doing outreach activities. And they're gonna once a week sit with children and read books and do other activities. So we've offered them space in the meeting house when the weather is bad. If the weather is good, they'll do it in the garden. If the weather's bad, they'll do their activities in the meeting house. Uh, we were approached by a local Cub Scout troop to come and do an activity at the meeting house. And one of our members met them there and she's very interested in environmental concerns. And with the bag ban, this was just prior, a few days prior to the bag ban, she makes uh, reusable bags out of t-shirts so she had the boys, the Cub Scouts make uh, bags that they could take home from the event. So we're definitely reaching out to have more activities with children. Well, uh, Earl, did you have anything uh, quick to say? We only have a, a minute or two left, I'm afraid, but um, any thoughts on that? Uh, you're muted. There we go. Is that a question for me? Yeah. yeah. I think I'm pretty good. I've spoken enough, really. Uh, okay, well, we did, we did have one more question come in. I don't know if Agnes wanted to answer that one, but um, have any meetings been successful in attracting families whose young people go to friend schools uh, who are not Quakers already? At our meeting, the answer to that is no. We're kind of remote from other meetings and remote from friend schools. So we're not, uh, we have no one locally who would fit that category that's in the question. Well, I think, uh, oh, I, I think we're about ready to uh, move to the lessons learned section. Um, Linda, do you want to say anything about that or do you want to just go into it? Uh, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, yes. 
Um, I would like to add, um, uh, Earl was very kind in mentioning some of the different ways that uh, I was able to work with the Crepo Friends meeting. Um, Josh was also extremely helpful and did as much, if not more work than I did. Um, a big part of what we did was um, bring in people from the outside. Um, <clears throat> uh, Earl mentioned that his daughter is <clears throat> active in uh, publicity. And so she took on some activities and I worked particularly with some of the different Facebook groups. Um, we were able to get into a Facebook group with uh, about 6,000 um, uh, members uh, that <clears throat> usually focuses on business. But the gentleman who runs that was so excited to have a chance to come and see this historic building. Um, he used to um, bring his dog or bike to the site. And so um, that resulted in a very lovely article on his website. Um, we, we just did a lot of different kinds of um, advertising and uh, was mentioned earlier, sort of the niche, niche media, um, not just, um, well, Facebook and many other platforms have not only bluegrass groups, but um, you know, whatever kind of group you want. So always look around for what, uh, what new groups you can find, um, particularly historical groups. Um, they're always glad to know what Quakers are up to today. Anyway, moving into the next session. Um, uh, in, in this time, we're going to have the three uh, quarter organizers share some of the lessons learned based on their, <clears throat> their work and their observations uh, with this project, uh, with their own meeting and so on. Um, and uh, they'll start with a little story or some information about what uh, kinds of activities were going on in their meetings, and then really try to parse out some of the specific lessons learned about doing outreach, about integrating people into their meeting. And um, what, what uh, one of the former members of our team called pain points, we, uh, as we got started, um, it was quite difficult in COVID period, but um, each of the organizers attempted to connect with people from all of the meetings in the three quarters. And we quickly learned that uh, there were a lot of deficiencies, um, a lot of hesitancy about doing outreach and so on. And so our three, um, three organizers will share some of those challenges that uh, they found and uh, offer some suggestions on what was done in those situations. Uh, we wanna share these specifics not that there are perfect um, menu that you should simply select A, B, and C, but we hope that they'll um, give some ideas that will help you decide some different um, ways to adapt these responses that would be appropriate to your meeting or to your quarter. So anyway, um, so we're going to start with Josh and then uh, with Carlton and uh, end up with Charles. Again, Josh is with Haddonfield Quarter. Um, Carlton is with Salem Quarter. They're both on staff with the quarter as well as staff with South Jersey Quakers. And then Charles is, uh, besides being the quarter organizer, is clerk of Trenton Meeting. So um, Josh, if you'll begin. Um, and before we start, just I wanna let you know, we'll um, uh, take, end these presentations in the vicinity of 1130. And um, then there'll be um, a good 20 to 25 minutes for discussion. We'd like to hear from you about what your meetings are doing and so on. Um, and again, a reminder, if, you're, um, if you would prefer, uh, feel free to put uh, questions or comments into the chat and we'll bring them into the discussion for you. So um, Josh, yeah, you're up. Thank you, Linda. Um, so I would like to talk to you about three examples of meetings that are struggling to engage with new seekers or their um, greater community of friends. And I would like to talk to you about why inner visitation, um, as my lesson learned, was so important um, if we were going to stay a cohesive society of friends um, that we need to be in order to survive into the future. 
So my examples are not representative of any specific meeting, um, but rather a conglomerate of meetings I've worked with or visited in my travels. So I'm going to be deliberately vague um, in some instances to protect privacy. So bear with me on that account. The first meeting that we will call the, um, the self-sufficient meeting, these are meetings that have a number, have numbers of resources and um, can continuously reach out to new seekers to replace those who are aging away. They um, have adult programming, they have children programming, they often have paid staff and a budget that reflects those kinds of expenditures. Um, the kind of expenditures that small meetings just don't have. Um, they're doing a great, except that they have little to no participation in the greater Quaker community. They might have a member that shows up here and there for a quarterly meeting, but have long since foregone their relationship with PYM, and they frankly question the purpose of either organization. Now, I say these meetings have been doing great, but the next two examples I'm going to give you are meetings that were all, once totally self-sufficient, like this one. Um, the second meeting I would like to talk about is a meeting that we may be all too familiar with, and this is a meeting that's kind of given up. They've lost hope. They don't have enough people to sustain membership. Um, they don't have the numbers to make a sustained push at outreach. Um, even, their members are, are often really passionate about their cause. They're full of spirit, but they just don't know what to do to move forward. They're sure that as the last of them age away, the meeting will close its doors, and that will be that. Unfortunately, they may recorrect. We have seen this, um, this pattern go on with a lot of our smaller meetings. Um, and, and these are smaller meetings that used to be big. They used to have schools. They used to have all kinds of associations with them. And they're just kind of dying out. The third meeting, um, we're going to call the meeting under siege. Uh, this one's a hard one for me to talk about because um, Often the reasons for their isolation are related to some kind of previous trauma within their meeting, um, some kind of trauma they're still trying to heal from. Um, these might look like financial dishonesty, sexual or racial discrimination, uh, or abuse. Um, these traumas are often compounded because they're so hard to talk about, especially when it involves a betrayal of trust, um, especially when it involves someone in the meeting who is deeply cared for. Um, this might mean they're not interested in outreach, even though they might have more resources than the, um, the entropic meeting, the, the meeting that's, that's kind of going downhill. It, um, it might mean that they're also afraid of opening an old wound and are resistant to anyone new who might be a catalyst for change. So why inner visitation works? Um, our self-sufficient guys have been doing great for a while now, um, but the unfortunate truth is they can turn into these other two meetings. Um, without the greater resources of our, um, of our Quaker community. Um, these meetings can get themselves in trouble when the tragic or unexpected happens and they don't have those outside relationships to draw on for help, specifically those of their, their neighbors in the quarters. Um, right now we're dealing with a situation with meetings that, um, that have lost kids and families during the pandemic and, and do not see them um, coming back in the, as fast as they were hoping. Um, so these self-sufficient meetings have an opportunity now though to collaborate with other meetings who are also looking for families, um, families to join their community. This collaboration can go on to lead to um, other events and a deeper spiritual connection between meetings than would have existed otherwise. Um, so most of these suggestions are going to be two-way streets. While it's vital for meetings to send friends out to form those relationships, it's also important that we, as um, members, as meetings in support of our neighbors, do not forget that they exist and make every effort to reach out and visit whenever able. The, um, the entropic meeting, this meeting, the meeting that's kind of fading away, um, sometimes all it needs is some new blood. It's often as simple as going out and seeing what other meetings are doing, holding open houses, have regular intergenerational programming. Um, like I mentioned, one of the things we made sure um, to do with Propwell's open house was to invite other people to try to create that critical mass, um, to make new seekers feel welcome. Um, now our meeting under siege, um, which is, um, 
is in decline, but it can be arrested if some healing takes place. That often means looking for looking to its neighbors in the quarter for emotional or spiritual support um, so they can work through whatever trauma that has um, led them to put their walls up in the first place. This can be a really dark time, but these meetings have such enormous potential for growth if they are able to do the work. So real quick to recap, um, inter um, intermeeting visitation works in different ways for different meetings. Our self-sufficient self meeting, um, the attached purpose for visiting meetings is to build those personal relationships that act as a bridge for the community. At our meeting under siege, visiting means friends can go out to ask for healing help and know that they are part of a greater community of friends. And at our entropic meeting, they can go out and ask people to join them to help put events together and keep some seats warm until they have, um, they can fill them up with new seekers. Um, I talked a lot about why inner visitation helps from the perspective of the struggling meeting, but I would like to close with um, reminding friends that we have a responsibility as neighbors to reach out to those meetings to make sure that a line of communication stays open and make sure we visit when we visit, we show support and do not judge, we do not recruit and make sure that struggling meeting knows that they are not alone. That's it. Um, I think um, Carlton's next. Yes, thanks Josh, uh, that was really good. Uh, hi, my name is Carlton Crispin. I'm from uh, Woodbury Friends Meeting and Salem Quarter. So the thesis of my little section is um, the importance of both meetings and the quarters of engaging with groups in the community to bring new members and strengthen current membership. So Woodbury Meeting and other meetings in my quarter. Woodbury used to be quite active, but things had dwindled down over the years as people died off and got older and left and whatnot. Um, at one point, uh, there was only one single person going in person, and that was me, and that was even before uh, Zoom and COVID. Uh, the meeting did come back for a little bit, but we really only had one single outreach event in the entire year, which was participating in Woodbury's, the city of Woodbury's uh, ghost tour, and that stopped doing... Um, during COVID and we basically had nothing going on. Uh, barring a few exceptions, uh, it was a very similar story with other meetings in our quarter. So something obviously had to change um, both for my, my meeting and the whole quarter really. So um, one of the, fir the first big events that South Jersey Quakers organized was something we called a uh, COVID candlelight vigil. And uh, not all meetings participated, but um, the ones that did, it was a very good ex uh, healing experience. And it kind of shook things up and uh, got people to the meeting at a time of and uh, day of the week they weren't really used to. And it um, kind of connected them with other meetings uh, in the quarter and other quarters itself. Um, so we've had, a, a, our meetings had a number of uh, public and private events since then, uh, but the big ones were um, we had the Delaware Riverkeeper Network and some uh, city councilors come and speak to the Woodbury citizens uh, in our meeting about uh, the drinking drinking water issues. Um, and more more recently, we worked with the city to revitalize what they uh, an event they used to to have called Colonial Day. Um, it ended up actually being uh, rained out. It was just pouring rain, uh, so it was a little disappointing. But uh, both events had somewhere between 50 to 80 people come through the meeting house, and we've had a number of other ones as well. Uh, other meetings in my quarter have also started, either started having events or expanded events that they've had in the previous years, such as uh, protesting various causes outside their meeting houses uh, by the road. Uh, one in particular has a very busy intersection right on its corner. Uh, holding concerts with local, local musicians, uh, letting local groups use their buildings either for free or just for like a, a nominal fee. Um, using modern technologies like Zoom to hold online discussion groups. And uh, even our most isolated meeting, and I'm talking uh, 30, 30 minutes from the nearest meeting and an hour's drive uh, from the most of the other meetings, even our most isolated meeting had a quite a good turnout um, 
and they had a really interesting speaker their whole meeting house was was packed and uh, they actually gained further outreach because I was able to film it and we put it on our YouTube page um, so Salem quarter steering committee one of the things that really works for Salem quarter is that we have uh, what we call our steering committee that meets once a month month and has at least one if not two uh, representatives from each meeting and it keeps all meetings in contact with each other at least once a month uh, plans quarterly meeting uh, presentations for better speakers and minor issues are uh, taken care of before they have to go to quarterly and it burdens things down um, so they, they've been they've been around for a long time and they were doing pretty well but one of the things that one of the changes they made in the past few years uh, for the sake of outreach was it arranged uh, several quarterly meeting speakers who have Quaker themes but aren't maybe and maybe like a Quaker connection through family or something but were not uh, Quaker specific so that they could appeal to a, a wider audience um, besides just Quakers and get people into the meeting house um, so one great example was we had a, a woman named Joellen Jones who's a public defender and um, she has an amazing story uh, about forgiveness, and uh, there's a there's a video of it on her uh, South Jersey Quakers YouTube channel if you ever wanted to go look at it. But it was very very inspiring, and we must have had I'm bad with estimating numbers, but I'm going to say a hundred people in in one meeting house for that event from the, the community. So uh, lessons learned throughout the entire process. Um, as everyone has been, been saying here today, meetings have become kind of closed off due to fewer members, people leaving, getting older, and especially during COVID times. Um, most important thing uh, that I've found is to get people into your meeting house. Most people will not come back, but a few will, and just knowing the meeting is alive is super important. And going off that, many people if not most people think museum uh, meetings are museums and obviously we need to, to change that bit um, us starting to have events really jump started working on our meeting house again and it helped find issues that we've regularly overlooked uh, both in terms of like just cleaning things up and uh, just and the, the functionality of the meeting like you know broken things here you don't really notice until uh, you know you notice it <laughs> Um, working on active social media at very at the very least a small update maybe once or twice a month um, has gained my meeting several new members or attenders and it helps organize events um, other meetings uh, in our quarter have also also uh, bolstered their online presence to varying degrees um, things like having a dedicated website updating their old website um, or having like a little feature page on the South Jersey Quakers website or another website um, and just keeping things updated uh, but most people have uh, contacted us through Facebook so that's uh, that's that uh, having things in our newsletters and on our YouTube page has really improved visibility um, we've gotten hundreds of I don't know the exact details but hundreds of views uh, from that um, so we learned that we needed to create a single document with simple links to our meetings history, uh, meeting social media, our quarter info, uh, South Jersey Quakers info, and uh, PYM info all on one dedicated page. Um, and uh, when we give tours like the uh, Colonial Day tour, over half the people will take one of these flyers and now we just have them sitting permanently by the door. So anyone who visits the meeting house could just take a simple flyer and they have all the info they could possibly need. Um, many of these events serve as kind of a trial run for next year and um, some things might go wrong but you just do better next year. Um, all meetings are ready for children but they really need a few children in order to attract more and this is an issue that we've been trying to figure out uh, for a long time. Um, we've had some inroads but it's obviously an area we can continue to improve. Um, even with, we have two, two different newsletters. We deal with uh, quarterly meetings, our once a month steering committee meetings, and greater contact uh, between different meetings and different members. Um, events from one meeting 
that they'd like to have others uh, come to still slip through the cracks. So you can always be improving um, greater intercommunication between the different meetings and quarters. Um, even if you don't gain new members from an event, it still strengthens connections between your current members. Um, that I can't even stress that enough. That that's very important. And the final thing I'd like to leave you with is all of this does take time. Um, we obviously jumped into the whole project. We were really uh, trying to get things, uh, but things take always take longer than you than you uh, than you think. But it does uh, build and it gets faster over time. And the most important thing is you have to stick with it. So um, that's that's kind of it for me. And I will turn it over to Charles now. Thank you, Carl. So um, lessons learned is what we're talking about here. And I have a I have kind of a list um, and it it overlaps and uh, very unexpectedly with the uh, experience in other quarters, but you know, we're, we're all working as, as we work together, we're also focusing on the meetings in our own quarter and in Burlington quarter. Um, I came into the project uh, later than Josh Carlton and Linda because uh, the Burlington court uh, organizer uh, who had been working uh, had to, um, had to move on. And uh, so I came in, I got uh, notes from him and uh, uh, I learned things about my quarter that I didn't know, uh, such as the fact that about half the meetings were on a downward trajectory. And um, by his observations and what I later kind of figured out, um, the other meetings sort of including my own were not, um, not really uh, involved. So the things that we've talked about, um, you know, through the other uh, the, the other uh, folks' presentations, um, meetings that are that were struggling and meetings that were uh, uh, were not that involved with the rest of the world because they were fine. Um, and as I run through lessons learned, the first the first thing that I learned um, really was that um, to look at the meetings that were uh, struggling and call it uh, and assume that there was some apathy was uh, was really wrong. Um, in some meetings, it was a feeling that really as Quakers were really aren't supposed to be proselytizing. So should we be doing anything? Um, others were just not able to figure out what approach was going to work. Um, uh, and there was always the issue of financial resources and manpower. Um, and for, for uh, some meetings, uh, as, as they were aging out, though, the people were still feeling that it met their need. They needed the spiritual time, the quiet, the, the, the meditation, the, the nourishment that the meeting gave. And change isn't always comfortable. So maybe change wasn't what they really wanted. So, um, I call my next lesson um, that uh, uh, to grow the the meetings faced with grow or die as a as an option um, uh, were not easily able to find the resources for confronting that for for, for for the growing part the dying part is easy for the growing part. Um, our organization, South Jersey Quakers, uh, as Agnes had said, um, when we were reaching out to all the meetings in the quarter to talk about uh, um, how uh, outreach in general could happen, uh, that was when the loc locating resources was was clear. Um, so, I kind of the lesson uh, has to this lesson has to be learned by meetings that have and by quarters and by the yearly meeting. Which I, which certainly attempts, but there's, it's a distance from yearly meeting down to the hundred and some monthly meetings that makes it difficult for individual uh, connections. But within a quarter, you have a handful of meetings and um, those connections to make sure that uh, meetings that are struggling uh, know where to uh, where to find those resources. That 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 lesson needs to be learned, not by the struggling meetings, but by the the, the places that have the 
information, the resources, and uh, and can give the support. Certainly, that the third lesson I've I, I learned was that outreach to public events is absolutely vital. That outreach to public events, whether it's in person or hybrid, um, it lets people know of your presence. As we've said, um, uh, you know, the musical performances, speakers, especially ones that won't, uh, you know, that that are outside of just a specific Quaker topic, um, advances both visibility, uh, brings people uh, uh, into the space, uh, even if they're not going to be returned, they're part of the thing and part of all the germination that will happen of, of positive things. And we've talked a bunch about events, so I won't go any farther there. Another lesson uh, touched on a couple of times, but really important is that the appearance of our buildings is important. We, do, we, we can't look like abandoned um, ex-museums. Um, we need to have uh, exterior and interior uh, be welcoming and be fresh. Uh, here in Trenton, um, back when the 250th anniversary of the um, uh, building of, of this building, which was in the, in, um, uh, 1989, um, a sign went up that said, you know, for 250 years, this building has, you know, the Quakers have stood, have silently stood for what, it was, it was perhaps an appropriate wording in 1989, but it was still hanging out there a few years ago. And it really, really made it look like we were a museum. We were silent. We were, yeah, I mean, we worship silently, but we ain't silent the rest of the time, or shouldn't be. Uh, and uh, it's just a realization, get that sign down, uh, you know, take care of things. So that, um, uh, and Barnegat has um, uh, a new uh, sign. I know Cropwell is speaking of the, of the need for a new sign. Um, the, you know, the, the face that we give to the, to the world is really important. Um, Another lesson, and this one I'm going to uh, use uh, some examples from our meeting because uh, we're we're uh, also um, Trenton is is um, doing uh, a bunch of outreach, um, but uh, our, our outreach in in is focused on uh, what this meeting uh, has found as a you know spirit has, has moved us to to be of service to the community. We're in a neighborhood. Um, that's very challenged by all the prob urban problems that you that that we know of and our um, outreach. Um, let me. Um, I want to try to make sure that I say this and that it don't. No, okay. Uh, okay. My meeting is in the center of the neighborhood in Trenton that suffers multiple problems of today's urban existence. We've developed relationships with individuals and local black and brown led organizations that then give us the opportunity to learn what is needed. Respect is prime. So our community barbecue, for example, coming up next month, the 17th, and everybody's welcome uh, at one o'clock uh, is where we sit together with our neighbors to eat and talk and events for, for the meeting of neighborhood children and mostly neighborhood children. We have an Easter egg hunt it was t-shirt making during the winter, gardening. Um, these are not just our charity. These are our involvement um, and our connection with the humanity of our neighbors. This is outreach. This is um, uh, uh, what is needed here. And this is how we are, uh, I mean, one of a number of ways. I mean, right now I'm kind of locked in a little room because Black Lives Matter is preparing spaghetti in the next room for distribution in front of the meeting house uh, uh, this afternoon. Um, we have other organizations that, that are in here using the building. So the vitality of, of the meeting is now much clearer to everyone because they see things happening here. Um, the uh, other thing that's happening is that uh, we have uh, a small number of African-American members, uh, but it is uh, very possible to me that uh, although many of the organizations that we associate with, uh, that we have connections with are um, uh, not many, a couple of them are evangelical uh, churches, 
Uh, we're not trying to poach and neither are they, but uh, within the neighborhood where conversations that we can have with friends, um, some of these neighbors are, are, are kind of intrigued by the idea that, you know, our, our worship is one that resembles Pentecostalism in the sense that it's really looking for that direct connection between spirit and us and ourselves. And um, the, uh, they're, they're, they seem intrigued and we'll see if, uh, if we do find people coming in. In the past, um, you know, a couple of people who have unfortunately passed away but were in the neighborhood uh, became part of Trenton meeting because of things we were doing outside, especially the community barbecue. Gentleman across the street, a beloved man who was tragically murdered um, and is sorely missed. Um, uh, but he became a part of the meeting because of our barbecue. Uh, lesson six, social media works. As, as said, at a minimum, a website with current information about the meeting and where some, at least some minimal amount of updates about events and, and, um, uh, and reports on events. Um, that means people will find you. Uh, they'll know you're, that you're still in existence and vital. And Facebook is ubiquitous in society. And there are some difficulties for persons of a certain age to create a page for a meeting. It takes a little effort to keep it up and to keep a website up to date. It allows both seeker, new seekers and folks who have experienced some contact with you, but you know, and now they say, I, you know, let me check what's happening over there, or they, it, you know, pops up in a search um, or in the Facebook feed. Uh, it, it, you know, the social media stuff is, it's really important. Another lesson, uh, uh, a brief one, snail mail at this point is pretty useless. Where there were postcards applied by the early meeting sent out by the hundreds to targeted locations in a town with no useful response. And postage costs can add up. The thing that, um, reflecting back to Carlton, uh, I'm sorry, jo jo Josh, is, Josh is talking about um, how uh, his visitation uh, point was important across all meetings. Um, the, I, out, doing outreach is certainly not something that the self-satisfied meetings uh, should ignore because a vitality can wane and there's, um, the, the, you know, the, there's no, uh, no reason that the message that uh, should be reaching seekers, uh, you know, because there are people trying to find a, a spiritual home. And if you're a self-satisfied meeting, not making your, uh, uh, the, the presence of Quakerism known uh, in, in, in the best way possible, th those, those people will not find us. Uh, and then uh, really a lesson, uh, but, it's, it's a truism acknowledged and it has also been touched on is that the seeds from a meeting's outreach may take a long time to germinate and produce countable results in the worship hour. I mean, Barnegat and, and Little Lake Harbor and, and our meeting have had some more non-recurring attenders, visitors, uh, but it has also come to a couple of new regular attenders uh, Trenton has added um, a member who was uh, an attender for a bit and uh, you know, first came to us not too long ago. So um, that's it. There's a bunch of lessons learned, some of which were are uh, translatable to uh, the meetings that are in the position of grow or die, and some of which are important to all of us, all meetings, and to quarters and to the annual meeting of how, how to identify, how to, how to support, how to be uh, promoters of the 
outreach that uh, the uh, Quakers and the religious, religious Society of Friends of General Needs. And we have um, uh, had success uh, because of the foresight of, of Linda, Haddonfield, Salem, and Burlington Quarter uh, of this organization, South Jersey Quakers. Um, that's, that's, that's a thing that works and that other quarters or you know, collections of meetings might want to consider being able to join forces to have some you know, uh, uh, amount of paid staff. There are grants. We've seen Shoemaker and Dolier and uh, PYM uh, provide us with, uh, with sources of money so that we can have some, um, you know, some time that doesn't have to just be on the volunteers' shoulders. And back to you, Linda, I think. Uh, so I want to thank um, <clears throat> uh, Josh and Carlton and um, Charles for uh, sharing your insights, um, different ways to address some of the pain points that we've identified over the last two years. Um, I'm administrator for the project, which means that I mostly think about how do we raise funds and provide reports to our donors? Um, how do we... Um, do program planning, uh, monitoring and evaluation, um, doing a lot of writing, um, particularly for the newsletter um, and uh, trying to really think about long-term strategy for the project. Um, it dawned on me that it would be important to go back and share with you that um, when we first started this project, um, there were no longer field secretaries and so our three quarters did not have regular contact between uh, you know, individuals or uh, different representatives. And so um, we really started this in a way to both pool our resources. Um, Haddonfield uh, Quarter at that point did not have a website, um, but we had a coordinator. Um, Salem Quarter had um, Carlton as the media director doing um, social media and newsletter and uh, Burlington Quarter did not have any staff. Um, and so this was a way to come together to both um, try to lift up visibility for Quakers in the whole area um, so that we could do advertising that was branded um, and would uh, allow people to find where other Quakers were here in South Jersey. Um, the other goal was simply to um, strengthen the Quaker community and to provide for uh, intervisitation and communication. And um, I think uh, it, the first conversations began three years ago. And I think one of the most important things we've done in these three years, besides the different uh, uh, points of infrastructure that we've created with sharing resources and information about upcoming events is that I think by, by helping people connect and learn more about what's happening in other meetings, we've really been able to provide some hope, particularly to the smaller meetings that were uh, increasingly uh, losing members and not gaining new members. And so um, that's why we wanted to share with you <clears throat> the uh, Barnegat and Cropwell models because we think <clears throat> they, they did their work over the last year and some in very different ways, but in each case really helped to raise their visibility in the community and um, in, ultimately have really energized folks within their meeting. And that in turn gives them hope to um, hope and creativity to not only continue the work, but to continue building. Um, it's quite clear from that experience that it really does take time. I understand there's, uh, I think it was Abington started their outreach work 10 years ago and they're still working on it. They've gone from a fairly small meeting to a larger meeting um, that's much more dynamic. But after 10 years, they're still working, I'm told, 
uh, working really carefully to continue that outreach, knowing that it's not something you can um, slack off on once you've gotten to the uh, preferred space. So, um, so it takes time is really an important lesson. Um, I wanna share some other lessons that um, either I see from um, a different perspective or work um, of my own with different meetings, either here in uh, our quarter and with um, uh, Southern California quarter. I used to uh, be AFSC uh, liaison with um, meetings out in California. So I'm gonna draw on a slightly broader uh, group of folks. But um, I think especially with this project uh, coming together three quarters, uh, 27 meetings, um, it's really clear that we as friends are a stronger and more vibrant community when um, we're working together. And that in turn helps increase uh, the possibilities of us having much more impact. Um, we've seen through the years, individuals meetings trying to do one thing and another meeting tries to do something. And each of those activities are successful, but when we're really working together and doing similar things, um, I think it really has the potential to give us a great deal more impact overall. Um, quarters, of course, can play a really significant role, uh, whether or not you're able to pull together three quarters, but um, uh, what we've seen, uh, particularly with um, working with Cropwell, um, having uh, Josh and myself come in, sort of wearing two hats, one for this project and simply as quarter staff, um, our knowing people in other meetings and being able to invite people in as resource people, um, people who had the literature tables at the open house and so on. Um, there really is an important role for quarters. and. There seems over the years to have been a sense that, gee, maybe it's time for quarters to be laid down because they really don't do anything. But in fact, um, when a meeting is um, really close to the brink, quarters can bring in a lot of resources to help them get back on their feet and to grow. And so I can't um, emphasize enough that um, it's really important for people to be working together on outreach um, so that we're pooling our resources. You can print more banners, print more brochures. Um, you can share resource people. Um, you can develop strategies for what's appropriate to uh, the interests of people in your region and so on. Um, and I, I simply want to note at this point that currently there's only one full-time uh, quarter coordinator in all 13 quarters and that there are six um, quarters, uh, last I heard, that have a part-time uh, coordinator. My work uh, before this project was only 10 hours a month. Um, and so there's only really limited uh, things you can do with that little time. But still, it makes a big difference to have even a part-time coordinator. Um, it was touched on before about the importance of children um, and what uh, all is required to bring children in. I'm gonna ask Melinda to speak about this um, uh, when we finish off the uh, discussion. She's put some materials in the chat and uh, we'll be um, uh, sending out an email. Uh, Kamani will be doing that, I guess. Um, materials from um, from our South Jersey project and from Irene's work this afternoon. Um, and so you will get some uh, links and some information that's uh, helpful. But Melinda's is specifically targeted um, to how to uh, attract and, and retain families. Um, in doing outreach, it's really important that, um, that you do good outreach and so on, but um, I've seen meetings be, especially small meetings, be overwhelmed with an influx. Uh, there was one meeting in California that had five active members, but all of a the sudden they had uh, 10 or 15 new people, and they just weren't able to integrate them into the meeting. And uh, there was a lot of friction, a lot of problems, 
people brought in their experiences from their churches um, or other organizations. And it was really hard for the Quaker faith and practice to shine through. And in spite of everyone's best interests and, and efforts, um, most of those people left uh, by the end of the year. So um, don't be discouraged when you have one or two or three new people come at a time. Um, that uh, gives you an opportunity to help them uh, become part of the meeting to get to know everyone there and um, for members of the meeting to get to know the new people and have enough time to be able to um, help introduce them to um, how we operate our processes and our beliefs and so on. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's also important for us as we're welcoming new people that we be open to change. Um, I'm, I'm from the uh, anti-war generation and I remember all the conflicts between our parents' generation and um, uh, the baby boomers now uh, today, but hippies in the old days, we were questioning everything. Um, and there were, there were important, um, there are important issues that we really wanna retain in terms of our faith and our practices. But there's a lot of room for other kinds of uh, new ideas to come into the community um, and, and so on. And so please, please make sure that you've got some openness to uh, suggestions from new people um, and, and try to find a way so that new people coming in can take on a project that they feel comfortable with, that they feel will contribute to the meeting, and in fact might help you bring in more people, um, particularly from other generations. Um, so um, one of the areas that I know um, is a question of um, some concern is whether or not to use um, social media, particularly Facebook. Um, if you go to, um, again, our South Jersey Quakers um, YouTube channel, there's a, an hour long or no, an, a morning long workshop called um, uh, Facebook for Friends. And in the very beginning, Emily Provence and uh, former PYM staff member um, uh, Roma um, talk about why, um, why there are concerns about working with Facebook, but also um, bottom line is that even still there are a lot of people on Facebook and it's a, it's a free and fairly easy way to get in touch with folks. So um, if that's one of the things that uh, there are some questions about, there's some really important resources there. Also on how to keep your Facebook, um, uh, your meetings Facebook um, account really active and lively. Um, I, I'm gonna do a, quite a slide, um, go off to a side issue, but something that I've seen uh, both with um, social media accounts as well as, as for um, checking accounts. It's really important to know, to have several people who have access to the uh, information um, in terms of checking accounts. If you have a treasurer, it's really important to have an assistant treasurer who is uh, also bonded, hopefully, um, but who is also able to sign checks. Um, uh, and if necessary, if something, if the treasurer wants to go on vacation, or um, they age, you know, they age, start aging um, and having issues with memory, you've got someone else who can pick up the work in the um, financial area. And the same with social media. If you have someone who is really active on your social media account and suddenly they leave, they drop out, um, they can't do it anymore. Um, it's really important to have someone else who can step up um, right away and do that and who has all the account information. Um, if once, once that information's lost, it can be quite difficult to regain access to it if the person who set it up is no longer available um, to your meeting. Um, it was already talked about um, how important the appearance of meetings are. Um, in the last few years, uh, several meetings in Haddonfield realized they actually had very serious um, mold issues. Uh, when I was first looking for a meeting 
in our area. Uh, I went to a meeting and the mold immediately had me crying and um, and my nose was draining like crazy and I found that it was just very not possible for me to go back to that meeting. Um, we also saw another meeting um, did very extensive planning. They brought in architects, they brought in um, interior designers and put together a formal proposal <clears throat> that um, they could share with donors and were able to raise considerable um, amounts of money to really update their meeting house. Um, it's much fresher, it's much more inviting now. Um, a, a number of things like in the kitchen are now up to code um, and so on. Um, in our meeting, for example, we're also um, putting in a better sound system because we have some uh, older members for whom hearing is an issue. Um, and so make sure that you have uh, that you're up to ADA, uh, Americans for Disability Act uh, standards. Um, you don't wanna have someone who would love to become active in the Quaker community, but isn't able to come into the building. Um, as was mentioned here, a really important part of outreach is uh, simply word of mouth. Um, that's one of the ways in which um, a Facebook account can be quite handy if you uh, include, make sure that the share function is, uh, is an operation uh, so that when you are holding activities um, uh, or events, you can simply have uh, members of your meeting hit share and then they can share that with their friends locally. So it makes that kind of uh, word of mouth, um, person to person outreach uh, fit together. Um, one of the, um, one of the, I'm sorry, this is a little scattered because um, I had a list and, and have been adding as we've been talking. Um, one other thing that has been really important with our project is having the, um, the South Jersey Quakers newsletter. Uh, a great deal of that is actually upcoming events or reporting on recent events. And, um, that's really provided an important way for people in one meeting to know what's happening in other meetings, maybe in a different quarter, um, a different part of the region. Um, first of all, that gives hope that there's all these, um, uh, most people uh, have commented to us that, gee, I didn't realize Quakers were actually so active here in South Jersey. Um, so it's raised visibility simply within our own community. But now people know more about what's happening in other meetings. And um, we keep hoping and, and have started to see some activities that, um, for example, one meeting had um, George Lakey come and speak. And we saw that another meeting invited him several um, months later. Um, so that picking up of ideas and uh, excellent uh, speakers uh, that might draw large crowds. Um, or you know, might uh, see how many people are working on climate change and uh, people might go, thanks to Zoom, might be able to go to activities in other meetings, whether or not they can go uh, in person. The hybrid option allows them to do intervisitation and to hear speakers that um, might not be of interest some of the members of their meeting, but they can join and, and identify some people who like to talk about that particular issue. Um, I think the last thing I wanna add here is um, besides the, uh, me, the materials that uh, Melinda has put into the uh, chat, uh, we'll be providing some materials through Kamani uh, about our South Jersey Quakers project. Uh, there's a short paper called Two Models, uh, which we took the title from uh, for this which provides uh, more details about what was done in each of the meetings. And so you can see the progression of activities. Um, and again, the idea is that that might give you some uh, approaches that you could adapt to your own meeting. Um, we'll also include uh, with that a two-year overview that includes all of the services we provide our meetings in the area. Um, 
another piece, uh, another place of really important resources is um, Friends General Conference. They have a very extensive um, section on doing both outreach and membership development. They're really excellent materials and um, I really commend you to their website. Um, finally, we are hoping to get uh, pulled together a, a resource page for the South Jersey Quakers website, uh, highlighting some of the different activities we've done here. It'll have links to um, videos such as this and uh, Facebook for Friends so that people can easily find um, ideas on how to deal with different aspects of uh, outreach and membership development. Um, we'll have some examples of brochures or flyers that meetings use to um, hand out to first time visitors. With uh, Haddonfield, we have a, a threefold uh, brochure that uh, is given to people as they come in as uh, new uh, visitors. That brochure includes um, what's going to happen in the worship service, what happens after worship breaks, um, at least pre COVID. Um, it has the spices. What are some of the core values we have? It has a little bit of history of our meeting um, and it has how to get involved in the meeting. So we really touch on um, quite a number of things just to help people um, to help start, help them start uh, getting uh, involved in the meeting. So um, what I'd like to suggest is that we talk um, until maybe uh, 12, uh, 12, 10, and then formally close. And if people want to continue a little longer after that, um, then uh, you're, you're more than welcome to, to stay on for a few more minutes beyond. So are there any uh, questions or um, lessons learned from your meeting that you'd like to share with other people? I, if I could put out something that um, that I was uh, sort of going to say, I went, I, I had stuff written. I was going to just read one more boom, but it didn't make sense. So I went a little more uh, ad hoc. And that was part, I mentioned how uh, Trenton in its location has discerned the, um, the path uh, where we're having a lot of uh, outreach that involves our community, especially the children in the community. And there's a real, been a real connection um, with a number of the children and, and to some extent with their families. But the point is each meeting can look for what it is that is uh, a cause or something that they can connect with. Perhaps there's a climate group, perhaps there's, uh, there is some anti-racism work going on, perhaps there's other things and that, um, Finding uh, you know, how spirit is leading your meeting uh, uh, to uh, make that connection is a significant part of the outreach that uh, that can that can uh, serve the meeting, uh, serve you know, the the cause of the community, and can um, fulfill what we really are called as Quakers to do. You know. Thank you, Charles. Uh, another question or something you'd like to share? Uh, maybe a problem that you're facing in your meeting? Um, there is a hand, hand up. Oh, I don't see it. I'm sorry. Oh, um, uh, Ms. Kerber? Um, yeah, I, I guess I have sort of a question. Um, it, it's been really great hearing all of these sort of looking forward in a possibly positive way approaches. And um, I'm a little concerned that in our meeting, the situation is being framed more as emergency. We have a real disaster in the making here. Everybody has to pay attention. We're falling apart. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, it seems to me that it would be better to frame it, frame the discussion within our meeting as um, here's, you know, it's time for an opportunity. We have this opportunity to rebuild our meeting or to recreate our meeting. Um, I don't know. I, I just appreciate like a way to frame it that is more, it makes you feel more like you want to get involved with creating something new rather than just, you know, because we do have that problem of other meetings of families not returning. 
and we have other people not returning, but we're also in very good shape in a lot of ways. I mean, our house and grounds keeps the place looking beautiful. I think financially we're okay. We have a core group that's big enough that we do have different committees. Um, so um, I think we have a lot to work with. So suggestions for the right words to frame this? Mm -hmm. Uh, team members, would any of you like to respond? Uh, I did. Um, I'm not sure it, I would classify it as words per se, but uh, one thing that I didn't really get a chance to say is um, a lesson I've, I've been learning, uh, especially lately, is I think we need a, a few more um, kind of fun events that are that are Quaker based, and it kind of ties in actually to the Quaker Fun Day, which I didn't intend, but. <laughs> Um, I've noticed that so our, our three quarters do uh, tri quarter, and that is uh, incredibly uh, fun, a lot, as long with um, having workshops and whatnot. And I've been trying to put together a few other, uh, either quarter wide, a few meetings wide, or even three quarter wide kind of fun events, and um, that can be that can be framed in a way of. Uh, you know, just having the meeting have fun, but it can also be an outreach thing, and it can also be a workshop type thing. So that's that's something I've been I've been trying to do. I'm not sure if it helps, but yeah. I I would like to speak on the um, the opportunity aspect. Um, I, I when uh, when Melinda was talking, I, I just felt like this shudder um, because we do need to change. You know what? Um, and here you are with the opportunity to have a fresh start. Um, you have you have a little bit of despair, but that can be a great motivator. Um, it can be a great opportunity to reach out to the meetings that are around you and and collaborate in a way that is going to be um, is going to broaden your spiritual relationship, both within your meeting and um, in your, your greater Quaker community. Um, that's that's how I try to phrase it within my own mind when, when I'm thinking about how rough these um, these projects are being and how, how sad some of the um, the states of the meetings are in right now. Um, we have two more hands. Um, Irene, do you want to go? Yeah. Uh, responding to the um, the question from uh, I, I can't um, Gwen, is that your first name? Um, I think the way I like to phrase uh, what we need to one aspect of this issue that we need to focus on is that we've been hiding our light under the bushel, and especially in this time when there's such an exodus of people from other denominations because they're frustrated by the dogmas, by the um, antiquated, I'll say, uh, social um, constrictions on, uh, and, on the way they think about um, women in leadership in their, in their church or um, other kinds of uh, religious uh, restrictions that don't make sense to them anymore. And we have a, a deeply spiritual practice with no dogma. Uh, that just opens up so much possibility for, for growth and for enrichment that you don't have in a, in a traditional church. And if, if, if there is one theme that we could promote, it's it's that. The, the concept of continuing the revelation is, I think, unique, or certainly unique compared to mainline religious organizations. That's a great asset that we don't talk about very much. Um, we're hoping that the hope that our meetings found, uh, that it was possible to pull back from the brink um, could be something we could share with your meeting and um, let people know that, uh, yes, it's going to take time, it's going to take focus, but that there are resources, there are others who can help, 
um, that it, it is a crisis, but it's also something that, um, that can be addressed and it is possible to, to re, uh, reinvigorate a meeting. So um, good luck. Um, please feel free to be in touch with, with our team members later if some specific questions come up in your meeting. Um, Bianca? Thank you, Linda. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about that opportunity and about that enthusiasm and the positivity that you're bringing forth. Um, and I just want to encourage you to lead by example. So maybe you write a newsletter article or maybe you post something. Um, this upcoming July newsletter for Concord Quarter, I wrote a article about the value of social media. And I featured a gentleman who PYM had wrote an article about him using his Twitter account to simply be a Quaker on social media and just embodying what that means so that people have more of an example and they can start to have that transparency that comes with social media. That's what the opportunity is. It provides a space, it provides a platform for Quakers to be Quakers so that people can start to see, wow, that is just like me, or I do have those interests, or I do want to get involved in those things. That's what Quakerism is about. So it's not about having to necessarily change who you are or what it is to be a Quaker. It is starting to step out of the bushel that you're hiding under and letting that light shine on a new platform so that people can start to see and identify with that and then find their spiritual home so they don't feel so alone in this world. That's the point, that's the purpose. So you have to come out of your comfort zone and simply show people who you are, who you truly are on the inside so that others can be attracted to that, find that space and finally feel comfortable in this world being who they are as well. Thank you. Um, Kent, did you still wanna add something? As we uh, approach this topic, and there's a number of us that have spent a, a, a lot of years looking at um, why the meetings and quarterlies are fighting the growth battle alone. And I notice as I look at this, this um, group, I see coordinators, communication and uh, Josh, who I know quite well, and uh, those those types of resources used to be available to a lot of quarters. Mm -hmm. And as you look around yearly meeting, you'll notice that the most robust, and by the way, I'm thoroughly impressed with what the South Jersey Quakers have accomplished. I've been involved with them with the uh, Membership Development Granting Group. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an example of if you actually put resources into doing the work at the level it needs to be done, which I'm sad to say, Philadelphia Yearly Meeting has never done. And I think it's time that we really look at how do we support our monthly and quarterly meetings because the only entry, there's two now two entries to fill it off a yearly meeting. One is as a member of a monthly meeting that the recorder sends in at the beginning of the year. And now, thank heavens, there's an opportunity for people to become yearly meeting members without having to take six to eight months until someone thinks that they might be good enough to be a Quaker. And we have to be realistic about what our expectations are and how we have to change our old paradigms and mental models to, to allow people to interface with us and work with us and feel our spirit and then become Quakers. And until we do that, we're actually closing our, all the things that people really like to do with a yearly meeting. You have to be a yearly meeting friend. And I understand that, but look at what we've had to try to do to step around that, developing new categories and talking about this and talking about that. This has been going on See, the Membership Development Support Fund was set up in 1997. The first year, $45,000 worth of grants were given out to 
-hmm. monthly and quarterly meetings. We're lucky now if we get to give away, what'd you say, Irene, $3,000 a year. Ooh. We consider that a good year. It's a lot. It certainly is a lot less than 45,000. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so with money available, uh, you know, people aren't even looking to the yearly meeting to see what they can get. So we've got to change all our paradigms or else that little study of two old ladies sitting in a meeting with $25 million trying to decide what to do, it will come true. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Jen. Um, in some ways, this is a good segue to uh, the program this afternoon, uh, where we'll be both identifying what resources are available from PYM um, to help meetings uh, in their outreach and uh, membership integration activities, but also what are some of the areas where um, additional resources are needed. Um, as, as we got deeper and deeper into the South Jersey Quakers work, we began realizing that what we're doing really should be done on the whole yearly meeting level. That um, just as I talked about the popcorn effect of individual meetings doing um, really exciting outreach activities, but if it's only one meeting at a time, um, the, the impact is not nearly as great as if we were all using the same branded uh, materials uh, that were put together by professionals um, with great layout and uh, good social media uh, information and so on. So um, please do uh, plan to come back at one o'clock for, uh, for the second part of today's workshop. Um, are there, are, is there maybe one or two more questions? Um, all right, well, let's um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your joining us for this conversation. And um, please do be in touch with us. Um, the publication that, um, that you'll get, uh, that's sort of the two-year update on our South Jersey Quakers has uh, in, uh, emails to get in touch with our, uh, as, uh, our team uh, members who you've had a chance to meet today. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Yeah.